I have been asked by several people talking about my Instagram uh, what to do to get started in woodworking. Really, the only way to get started is to have your own supply. If you don't have your own wood, uh, you're already 50% of your profit has, has diminished. Because in the lumber industry, from what I understand, from what I've experienced, that uh, when you buy a log, the cut material, when it's dried and ready, is worth 10 times more than the log. So if you're buying your material from someone else, you're passing that profit to them. Uh, that being said, log prices vary. And uh, you can get in a spot where log prices have gone through the roof. And uh, maybe that's not a good year to buy. And so I don't buy every year, but I do buy when I need certain sizes. Popular sizes are for dining room tables. And so if I can get some of that material, like right now, you'll probably see a log truck come through here in one of my next videos. Uh, I just purchased some material in Oregon. There's uh, three black walnut logs of significant size and two maple logs that are significant in size. So the question of uh, materials is, is, is really the only issue, is how do you get your materials? Okay. So there are a lot of guys around that, uh, that are log hunters. They'll go up into the mountains and on their own time, I don't know what their other job is if they have one, but they'll, they'll locate some material that they think is accessible and sellable, and they'll approach the property owner, and uh, they'll offer them an insult or a, a good price, who knows. And uh, they'll call me before they take it down and make sure there's a market, and then they'll take it down and put it on part of a load. But uh, that's not the only resource. You can go advertise and take trees down yourself if you're so inclined. I did that for a couple of years and then I started using a tree service and then uh, I realized I, I don't really like being a lumberjack and so I, I just mostly stay in the shop now and then I, I hire that stuff out. If I find a, a few trees that are on someone's property that are uh, uh, negotiated to a, a good sale, I, I will send a tree service out to uh, take them down and then uh, a tow truck following. I'll take everything that's 15 inches uh, in diameter uh, and over, and the rest of it just gets chipped. I know it seems like a waste, but 15 inches is kind of where I've, I've set my minimum. I can get a bench or two out of a log, and that's about it when the, when the size is small like that. So there you go, that's uh, wood sourcing. Spec pieces versus pieces that pay the bills. And my philosophy is the more I'm working with my hands, the, the better I get. And that's my whole motivation is to, to develop as many skills as I can because it's more interesting doing more varied stuff. You can get bored just doing one thing. So I do spec pieces, and I really still have to pay attention to keeping on top of the table thing, though. If you turn the camera around, you can see right there, I have four carts just full of, of tables. I always make sure I have seven to 12 tables on my carts at all times, varying from seven foot rectangle, live edge, to seven foot non-live edge and up to 12 feet long, some of these tables, uh, and also have some round tables because as soon as you make all rectangular tables, somebody wants a round one. So I have a 60 inch uh, and a 48 and I have one in uh, oak and almost everything I do is in black walnut, except for this project that I'm working on right now. When you have predominantly one kind of wood invariably there's a customer that's gonna come in and want something you don't have. So it's always good to keep uh, an ace in the hole. And that's what I call having one big maple or one big oak slabbed out and dry. 
most of my work is black walnut, so uh, people kind of uh, prefer the black walnut. I know this is going to make black walnut harder to get for me, but I, I don't really care. I, I don't have enough volume to suck up all the black walnut that's in the world anyway, so who cares? And I just assume someone else benefit from this issue as well, because uh, I can't possibly make enough tables to fill the market or other items, and it's going to take you, because China is, is killing us here. If we don't have manufacturers here in the United States uh, that make high-end goods, somebody's going to fill that market. It's tough to figure out what to make. Uh, I have always told every person that's asked me that I am still making the thing that my first customer asked me to make, and that's a trestle base for one of my tables. And it is one of my best-selling items. So you can't, uh, you can't go wrong making what your customers want. And, and until you know what your customers want, make something that customers want from your competitor. Uh, do some snooping. Go uh, to a competitor's workshop. Make friends with them. Don't compete with them, but uh, be uh, helpful to them. And you'd be surprised. They will give you their overflow, the stuff they don't want to do. And it's a good way to get started. People are asking, what product should I make starting out? Well, I would say cutting boards. You know, it doesn't take much room, doesn't require much uh, other than tons of labor. It'll perfect your, your skills, precise uh, uh, fitting together of small blocks. And if you can survive through that, <laughs> your fingers and all that, uh, remembering that the first year of woodworking is the most dangerous for your fingers and your safety. So uh, once you get established, say uh, you've managed to not cut anything off and you're in your second year, uh, still have your main items that you're making, you're going to want to not be bored. Go online and contact every designer and home builder and contractor <coughs> and uh, people in the trades, just go for a month and every day make a couple of hours worth of effort to call some people and keep a good journal on who you talk to and make some contacts and provide extra attention to interior designers. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Uh, I probably work with 20 interior designers, and uh, not all of them will contact me every year. But, uh, you know, they're just, for me, it's just one area. You just big slab furniture, is, they kind of have an idea that's, that's mostly, mostly what I do. But my portfolio keeps showing the designers that I'm not just a one-trick pony. And that's why the violins, that's why the guitars, that's why uh, the benches and, and all, all the weird stuff, the vanities and mirrors and hanging lamps and hanging uh, shelves and all of these things are the result of calling and staying in the mind of the designers. The one thing that I do is I have uh, compiled a list of... Uh, uh, of phone numbers of people that I have sold to. Every one I have ever sold to, I have a spreadsheet. And so I've isolated their phone numbers and put them in my phone. And I, every time I make a thing that is not a table, or if it is a table, it has to be spectacular, uh, I show 75 to 100 people what I did. And maybe it's my heightened narcissism. <laughs> Sure, that's it. But I generate sales out of, out of those people. If not directly to those people selling them again, uh, they're not just the people that I've sold to, but uh, if I go to a home show, I ask people who are looking at my work, and if they're looking at it favorably, I say, would you like to see my work every week when I finish a new and unique item? 
and all you have to do is put your phone number in my phone. I hand them my phone, they put their phone number in, and I did that only in one show, but I increased my list to like 130 people. And sometimes they want stuff that I just made, and it's, if it's a spec piece, uh, sometimes it just gets sold immediately. But other times, I just take a picture of it, and I use pixel cut to make uh, the, uh, uh, the background disappear. It really makes your item pop. You can get a nice shadow on it. It's like having a white background. Pixel cut, that's the one. You have to pay to use it, but it's really good. And so just uh, keep a list of all of the people that you have seen that pose interest to your goods. And keep showing them that you're, you're, you're growing. And keep uh, uh, expanding your repertoire into artists that uh, catch your eye. I, I suddenly uh, got an interest in doing some, something called brutalism. I didn't even know there was a, a genre called brutalism until someone in my feed said, you just did a brutalist piece. And I, I looked it up, and darn if I didn't. I, I love brutalism. So, uh, you learn from the, the group that you associate with. And sometimes these people are relatives on my list. Sometimes they're uh, other woodworkers. Uh, but if they're interested in the work, I, I send, them, send them my latest. Uh, how do you come to your pricing? So here's how I do it. Uh, I go online, and I look at the price of uh, a slab. Comparable thickness, comparable size, same species, dry. And uh, I don't just look at one side, but I, I get a general feel of, of how the market is. That's most important is what is the cost of your raw materials? Not what did it cost you. That's part of your profit package. But what did it cost if you had to go out and buy it? And so that's how I, I price mine. OK, so I get a price for a slab. And the customer walks in. Okay, uh, they decide they want a table, so I show them what I can do and what I have. And uh, when I quote them a price for that table, that price has in it a little bit for labor, and a little bit for sanding media, and a little bit for anything else that I use up my supplies. Otherwise, I can find myself pricing myself out of business. So. You always have to remember that some things are real expensive. Uh, epoxy resin, 24-hour uh, stuff, is relatively cheap, but the five-minute stuff that I use to assemble everything is just through the roof. It's $650 for a two-gallon supply. And uh, when you use it up as fast as I do, you could easily find yourself uh, dipping into your profit margin if there is, if you can set one up, a profit margin. It, just annihilating it because of supplies. So important, uh, get a good idea of what your, your slab costs, and then extrapolate that with labor costs. 